Matt McKenzie was a miserable man. He hadn't always been miserable. But two hours ago, a private detective he'd hired to follow Sherry, his wife of ten years, had provided proof that she was cheating on him. Sherry was supposed to be on a business trip, but the P.I. discovered that she was spending the week with her lover in a little town called Nevermore Hollows. The news and the pictures had hit him like a hammer to the head. Now he was dead inside. Nothing more than a corpse wandering from room to room with a single, all-consuming thought. Revenge. He wasn't strong enough for revenge. Hell, he wasn't even strong enough to confront her without losing his cool, knowing he'd probably end up crying like a punk-ass baby. So, instead of doing what he wanted to do, which was man up, confront his cheating wife, and beat the shit out of her and her lover, he decided to get drunk. He started with beer, but that didn't help numb the pain or stop the images the P.I. had showed him from flashing through his mind. He needed something stronger. He needed Jack Daniels. He had no Jack in the house, but... He was buzzed enough to make poor decisions, so he jumped into his car intending to drive to the closest bar, but two hours later he found himself passing a sign that said, Welcome to Nevermore Hollows, a town you just can't leave. Twenty minutes after that, he drove by the craftsman-style Airbnb cottage that Sherry and her lover were holed up in. Sure enough, there was her SUV, parked next to a jacked-up Dodge Ram. Of course, it would have to be some asshole with a redneck truck. The pictures the P.I. showed him proved that he was one of those country boy wannabes who sported the look but had never spent a day in his life on a farm. In every single picture, he wore a western shirt and a trucker hat, turned around backward, and aviator sunglasses. He looked ridiculous. Matt had the curious mixture of aching heart, angry mind, and numb spirit. He didn't even remember walking into the seedy pub, but seemed to come a little more mentally present after taking a seat at the bar. The bartender walked over. He was maybe 30, looked like he should be playing with a southern rock band with his long hair and chest-length beard. He wore a mechanic-style work shirt. A patch with his name was sewn over the left pocket. His name was Steve. What can I get you? Jack Daniels, Matt said. Steve gave him a knowing look, nodded, and poured a shot. Music played over the house speakers. It was an old blues tune by Muddy Waters about a man so down on his luck that he made a deal with the devil. After two more shots of Jack, Matt realized that he wasn't thinking so much about Sherry. Damn, he thought, this is like liquid amnesia. A loose smile spread across his face. He wasn't drunk yet, only slightly inebriated. More liquid amnesia he said to Steve. One more, Steve said. Then let's slow down a bit. Matt held up his fourth shot of Jack. Cheers, he said, while Muddy Water sang about selling his soul for a few brief moments of peace. What seems to be the problem, Steve said. He began wiping down the bar a few feet away. Matt was embarrassed, but just buzzed enough to be able to confess. My wife. She's cheating on me. Steve nodded, but continued to wipe the bar. Sorry to hear that, man. It happens. There were a few long heartbeats of silence. Then, Matt was surprised to hear himself say, I know where they are, her and her lover. They're getting it on in a 
a house across town. Steve stopped wiping the counter and stepped over. He leaned his elbows on the bar. I take it you've been by there? Yes, Matt said. You didn't do anything, did you? Steve asked. He seemed concerned. Matt shook his head. No, he sighed. I didn't. Steve looked thoughtful, as if he wanted to say something but thought better of it. You going to be okay? Matt looked down at the empty shot glass. He realized he was shaking his head. I don't think so. Steve poured a fifth shot. Why not? Matt held up the glass, peered deep into it as if it were a crystal ball, able to give him a glimpse into the future. The dark liquid showed him nothing. I want to confront her, confront the bastard she's sleeping with, but I just don't have it in me, man. Steve seemed to consider Matt's confession. If you did have it in you, what would you do? Matt gave a sad laugh, then slammed back the jack. Right now, in the state I'm in, I'd kill them both. There was another long silence. Then, Steve said, How would you do it? Matt gave him a bleary-eyed look. What do you mean? Steve shrugged. Sometimes just talking about something helps. I knew this guy once who went to a shrink for a similar situation. The shrink tells him to not hold all that anger and hate and desire for revenge inside. He said to speak about it even if it's dark is better than holding it in. All I'm saying is maybe it will help you if you let go if you just talk about how you would do it. Matt sat up straighter on the stool. Well, I hadn't considered how. He thought of the guy. His name was Derek, and he felt punched in the gut. Well, if we're just speaking theoretically, I'm so pissed off right now, I'd maybe take a baseball bat to him, break every damn bone in his body. Then, after I've caused him all that pain, I'd bash his damn head in. I'd brain the son of a bitch. Steve showed no judgment. He simply listened. Took it all in as if he'd heard this story a thousand times. When Matt finished laying out how he'd killed Derek, Steve asked, And your wife? What would you do to her? Matt started to speak, then his voice caught in his throat. This is stupid, he thought. Even if it is theoretical, I can't hurt my wife. Steve reached across the bar and put a comforting hand on Matt's shoulder. You don't have to do this. I, I was just trying to help. Even though she slept with the guy and is shacked up with him right now, she's still your wife. I'm, I'm sorry, man. The image of his wife with that asshole was too much for Matt to bear. As Steve spoke, it felt like someone plunged a knife into his chest and began cutting out his heart. No, he said. Matt felt his rage build. His hands trembled with it. It made his voice quiver. She clearly doesn't care about my heart, so if I could bring myself to do it, I'd... Um, I'd... I would cut her cheating heart out of her chest. Steve stood tugging thoughtfully at his beard. Feel any better by getting that off your chest? Matt let the images of revenge play through his mind. Yeah, he said. Maybe a little. But then he imagined Sherry and Derek lying in bed at the house they'd rented for their getaway. And his stomach churned, his heart twisted. No... I don't. 
Steve leaned surprisingly close and looked directly into Matt's eyes. I wish I could help. Matt gave a dark laugh. <laughs> you, you can help me kill the cheating bastards. That was the last thing Matt remembered before waking up from a terrible nightmare in which his rage had been unleashed. As with any dream, things didn't always make sense. One minute he was throwing back more shots of Jack. The next he was in the bathroom at the bar, splashing water on his face to sober up. He caught a glimpse of himself in the grimy mirror. His face was not his own. It was grotesque, with bulging, hungry eyes. The skin was mottled, rot black and corpse white. The tips of sharp yellow teeth protruded from behind his lips, and on his head were two gleaming black horns. Then he was in his car. In the rearview mirror, his face was now his own, but he felt that someone else was controlling his body. Then he was standing at the front door to the Airbnb, knowing that Sherry and Derek were inside. Then there was nothing but blackness. Matt came slowly awake. He was groggy and his head pounded from a hangover. The room was crypt dark, the curtains pulled tight. He was lying in bed, but not his own. He knew this because there was a clock on the nightstand that informed him that it was 3.35 a.m. He did not use a nightstand clock in his own bedroom. He rubbed a hand over his face and rolled out of the bed and stepped into a hallway. There was a small amount of moon glow coming from a window in the room to his right. He started toward that room but stopped when he was suddenly overcome with overwhelming dread. Where am I? How did I get here? He needed to find out, so he cautiously continued forward. He didn't turn on any lights. For some reason, he felt it was best not to. He stepped from the hallway into a kitchen. The shadows were deep, but there was just enough of the silvery light to show that someone was sitting in a chair in the middle of the room. He couldn't see any detail. He could only make out the dark shape. He hello he said. A long, tense moment passed with no answer nor any movement from the figure. I I'm a little hungover, Matt said. I just want to know where I am, and then I'll leave. When there was still no reply, Matt stepped over to the wall and flipped on the lights. In the center of the room, a man was secured to a dining room chair with duct tape. His head was slumped against his chest, and he was covered in blood. Oh, shit, Matt said. He cautiously walked over and squatted beside the chair for a closer inspection. The man was dead. At first, Matt didn't recognize him. The skull had been so smashed that the face was distorted. But... After closer inspection, and with sickening realization, he saw that it was Derek, his wife's lover. Matt reeled back, his mind raced, his heart pounded. He instinctively reached for his phone, which he kept in his back pocket. He was going to call the police, but his phone was smeared with something sticky. He looked at it and saw that it was blood, and for the first time, he realized that he was covered in blood as well. It was on his hands, his shirt, jeans, shoes. He caught his reflection in the window. There was a splatter on his face and bits of gore stuck in his hair. There was no way he could call the police. 
they would think that he had been the one to kill Derek. Before he called anyone, he needed to understand what happened. He closed the blinds to the kitchen window, dragged another dining room chair in front of Derek and plopped down. He tried to piece everything together, try to understand how he had gotten here, how he had gotten covered in what was presumably Derek's blood. He nervously fiddled with his phone, ultimately glancing down at the screen and activating the face recognition feature. The lock screen opened, revealing that his camera app was in use. In fact, he could see that someone had made a recording. He tapped on the recording and his blood became icy slush. The angle of the video was such that it was clear that the phone had been propped up on the kitchen counter. What it showed made Matt's stomach lurch as if something serpentine slithered there. In the video, Derek was already taped to the chair. Matt stood over him, a baseball bat in his right hand. Derek was pleading with him, begging for mercy, saying he was sorry for the affair with Sherry. Matt did not remember any of this. And he was profoundly disturbed when on the video he spoke with a voice that was not quite his own. It was lower, thicker. So you want to screw around with another man's wife, Derek? I'll show you what happens to cheaters. Matt hefted the bat and began violently beating Derek. He started with his knees, then his shins, then his arms and shoulders. As each bone shattered, Derek screamed so hard that his voice became ragged. Drool frothed over his lips and dripped down his chin. Then... Matt raised the bat high, and in that deep voice he did not recognize, he said, Go to hell, Derek. I'll be along shortly. He brought the bat down onto Derek's head, snapping his neck. Matt continued the assault until Derek's skull was completely misshapen. When the video ended... Matt dropped the phone onto the floor and put his head in his hands and fought back tears. He couldn't sit. He had to move. It would help him think. He stood. Then, suddenly, he was hit with a thought. If this was the Airbnb that Derek and Sherry had rented for their tryst, where was Sherry? He went through the house, going room to room, looking for her. When he got back to the bedroom in which he had woken up, he switched on the light and saw that the bed was covered in blood. When he had woken, the room had been too dark, and he had been too groggy to notice. But now, he was disgusted at the thought that he had been lying in blood, sickened, to realize it was the bed Derek and Sherry had been sharing. Then, he bent over and vomited when he saw that he had been lying next to his dead wife. Her heart had been cut out and lay on a pillow beside her head. He reeled back into the hallway, stumbled to the kitchen, and fell onto the chair in front of Derek. What? What have I done? He said aloud. With a choked gurgle, Derek said, You murdered us. Matt shot up from the chair, his eyes wide in shock. What? How? Death had already blackened Derek's face and covered his eyes with milky cataracts. He could not raise his head due to his broken neck, but he cut his eyes up at Matt. In a wet rasp, he said, We didn't think you had it in you. We thought you were too weak to do anything about it. Matt's sanity stretched to the point of snapping. 
This can't be real. From behind him, Sherry whispered, Oh, but it is. Matt jerked around. Sherry had stepped into the kitchen. She was wearing a white baby doll negligee, which was now smeared in blood, and there was a ragged hole in her chest. In her left hand, she held her heart. Matt stumbled back and bumped against the wall. He heard himself mumble, Please, don't. I don't understand. Get, get away from me. Derek jerked his shoulders, forcing his head to loll toward Matt so that he could lock his milky eyes onto Matt's. Something got into you, Matt. Sherry stepped into the kitchen. You were too weak to keep my heart, Matt. That's why I gave it to Derek. She took two menacing steps toward Matt, her hand held out, her heart sitting in her palm. No, Matt said, sliding against the wall toward the garage door. No, I, I didn't do this. I would never have done this. Too weak, Derek gurgled. A thick string of drool dropped from his chin onto the floor. But you got what you wished for. I never wished for this, Matt said. His voice was high-pitched, whiny, nearing the breaking point. Sherry stepped closer to Matt. Her once sparkly blue eyes were dark and lifeless. She grabbed his hand and put her heart in his palm. The only way you could have my heart was to cut it out of me. It's yours now, Matt. Take it. With those words spoken, she dropped dead to the floor at his feet. Matt shot a glance over at Derek. He had a grotesque smile that showed broken teeth and bruised gums. He gave a devious wink and said, See you in hell. Then... He went slack. Just then, the front door of the house exploded open, and three deputies came in low and quick, guns drawn. Matt had been so absorbed in the macabre scene that he had not even heard the sirens or seen the pulsing red and blue lights as they had arrived. Two deputies held him at gunpoint, while the other handcuffed him and escorted him out of the house. He was in a daze, trying to understand all that had happened. He heard one of the deputies speak into his mic and requested that the coroner be sent to the scene. A crowd had formed across the street, eager to see the dark drama unfold. As the deputies opened the back door of one of the cruisers, Matt saw the bartender, Steve, standing in the crowd. He had a smile on his face, and for just the briefest of moments, Matt saw him change into the rot, black, and corpse-white beast he had seen in the nightmare mirror. Matt realized on a deep, fundamental level that what Steve had changed into was a demon. Then, he understood. He never would have murdered Sherry or Derek or anyone for that matter. But in his weakened emotional state, made worse by the alcohol, he had allowed his darkest wish to be spoken aloud. And it was just his damn luck that it would be to a demon posing as a bartender looking for souls to destroy. A demon who had possessed him and helped him carry out his deadly wish for revenge. As the cruiser pulled away from the house, Matt watched as Steve tilted his head, just as Derek's had been, and gave a devious wink. (coughs) 